Hi everybody, this is Alex. I'm uh, from the Astro Imaging Channel and welcome back. It's good to see you all with us today. Um, Hi everybody, this is Alex. There we go. I've got to, I've got to mute myself. Hang on a minute while I get my sound straightened out, folks. Okay, I've got some instance. Oh, there we go. We were um, just, just before we went live, we were... Um, trying to fix something. Peace. I shut it off. Okay. Hi, everybody. This is Alex from the Astro Imaging Channel. Um, We've got good news and bad news for you. Um, if you came to hear Greg Kinklaw today, uh, Greg is not going to be able to be here today, but we will be rescheduling him for later so he can tell us about Sky Tools 4. Uh, however, Ron Brecher graciously um, opted to, to pitch in, and he's going to show us a little bit about um, uh, Pix Insight. And we're really glad that he could do that. I'm assuming he can still do it. Uh, he might have hurt his hand a little bit with all the arm twisting to get him to come here. So, but I'm sure he can still work a keyboard in his mouth. So he'll be able to tell us about a few things. I want to start sharing my screen because there's a couple of things I want to show you guys here. And uh, right now, you guys should see that whole thing. And I've got to start up my other um, program here and go to the astroimagingchannel.com, which as you see, pops up really quickly because I, I go to it a lot. And I want to show you some things. Am I sharing my screen adequately here, guys? Guys? Yes, it's fine, yeah, Alex. Right. Okay, great. Um, first off, on uh, June 9th, we're going to have a special show. And as you can see, we've already had six people process the data. OK, and um, Eric Davis or Eric Coles has been very uh, um, generous in donating us a beautiful set of very clean data of M42 and various people, <coughs> various people have have uh, pitched in to show us um, their work, how they were going to process it and stuff. Here's Greg's and Jeff's and John's and and. Jeps and Johns and Elmicos and Chris's, and they've got a description of what they did and some things like that. So um, please uh, take advantage of this opportunity to, first off, uh, process some really good data. And second off, um, send it in to us. And we're going to pick a few people here to ask them to come on to the program and actually tell us a little bit about it. Now, it's not required that you come on the program, of course, but we're looking for different ways of doing things. I've talked to a couple of people and they said, oh, but you know what? I don't really use Pix Insight, and so I really shouldn't be talking about it. Well, whatever you did use to process the image, that's what we want to hear about. One of these people, uh, I think, used a, um, um, a free program. And yeah, we want to hear about that. We want to hear about what free program you used. We aren't necessarily, we don't necessarily want to replicate the same stuff we do over and over again. We want to do lots of different things. So go to workshop up here in the corner on the Astro Imaging channel, go over here to this big red area. And when you click on that, up will pop a big load of data and you can either get it in PixInsight format with XISF pictures or you can get it in the fits formats and you can download all this beautiful data process it and get it back to us so please take advantage of that opportunity if you can and process the uh, data and we will be talking about it please get it in by june 2nd if you can because we want to then be able to reach out to you and get you to um maybe come on in and tell us a little bit about what you what you did here okay um that's one thing. Another thing is Tolga has been very busy doing a lot of things. And one of the things Tolga has done is he's um, 
uh, turned us on to a Google Calendar. For those of you who have used Google Calendars, you know that you can have a Google Calendar and you can add other people's calendars to your calendar. You can get notices of what's happening. And um, here we have uh, for May 19th, 26th, June 2nd, 9th, 16th, etc. All the shows that have been scheduled, that's actually not all the shows that have been scheduled, but they've all been put into um, a file here. So if you ever need to know where it is, what your upcoming shows are, hey, jump in there and take it. Okay. Um, I need to stop sharing my screen, which means I need to go over here and stop sharing. Go over here and... Stop sharing. And that should get me back to um, Ron. Ron is sitting here. He's uh, very nervous about this, I'm sure. Not really, but uh, hi, Ron. Well, hi there. Um, Ron uh, is coming to us from Canada, and I'm going to let him tell us about what he's going to be talking about and all that other stuff. So take it away, Ron. OK, let me just start uh, sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Um, I had to get out of that when I was having that feedback problem, so I'm just restarting that right now. Um, Eric, are, are we doing okay? Can you guys see my screen? Screen? Yeah, we can see your screen, Ron. I had to click on your name, but yeah. Okay, excellent. All right. So I want to give a short presentation and a demonstration. I think the whole thing will take about 30 to 40 minutes and then uh, questions and answers. If you have a question along the way, uh, let somebody know and they'll let me know and I'll try to answer it. If you don't know me, this is a little bit of information about me. I'm not gonna go through it all um, because you can look at this later on uh, YouTube. So I want to basically talk about the problem and the solution. We're going to talk about wavelets and scales and slices. And then I'm going to give a demonstration with multi-scale linear transform. And we're going to do two demonstrations. One is to remove noise early on in the workflow while the image is still linear. And uh, then the other demonstration will be near the end of the workflow where we want to sharpen detail in images that have been stretched and processed, and we'll do that using a mask. So here's what the problem is. The sky is dark at night, and that means that images of deep sky objects are inherently noisy, especially in low signal areas. So I'm talking about background, I'm talking about the dim, regions of a nebula but we want to see everything that an image can show so there's really two two problems one is how do we reduce the noise without losing detail where there's good signal and then sort of the reverse question is where there is good signal how can we enhance the detail without increasing the noise and the answer is multi-scale linear transform it can do both of those things and it does it very, very well. Uh, before we introduce the tool itself, I want to talk about what I'm, uh, this is a wavelet based tool. It looks at an image in layers uh, or images. It, it's a multi-scale tool. So we have to talk about what those terms mean, wavelets, scales and layers. And they all refer to the same thing which is structures of different sizes in an image. So the smallest structures tend to be noise, that uh, very fine graininess and maybe tiny stars. And then there's small stars, uh, very fine filaments in nebulas. The medium sized stars and fine dark lines like in here. Can you see my mouse? Yeah, we can see it fine, Ron. Okay, good. So uh, my mouse is going around some of these medium-sized, darker structures that we might uh, 
want to work on. Then there's large stars like these up here in the, the W at the top of the image, large nebula clouds like the running man. And then the largest structures are things like this brown cloud that basically is the whole left side of the image. So think about uh, breaking the image down into uh, layers where each layer contains a different size of structure. And then we can work on one layer without touching the other layers. It turns out that in deep sky images, most noise lives in the very smallest layers, layers one and two. Uh, and most detail lives in the small and medium layers, layers two and three. Uh, so you can separate them. There's a little bit of an overlap, but all that means is that you need to take the noise out early in the workflow before you do any sharpening. Otherwise, you'll just be sharpening noise. So multi-scale linear transform does both of these things. So in terms of noise reduction, it reduces the salt and pepper noise that I'm going to show you in a moment. That's done very early in the workflow before stretching. And uh, one of the really cool things about multi-scale linear transform is it's one of the processes that has a built-in mask. So you don't need to make an external mask to use this tool effectively. And I'll show you that. So that allows you to protect the stars and the bright parts of a galaxy or nebula uh, while applying noise reduction to the low signal areas in the background. Later on uh, in the workflow, we can use multi-scale linear transform. I'll just call it MLT for sharpening. And uh, so again, we do that after stretching. And we can again use the built-in mask, just inverted, uh, to select high signal regions for sharpening. But in this case, I'm not going to use the external mask for my demo, uh, the, sorry, the internal mask for my demo on the sharpening. I'll use the internal mask for noise reduction, and I'll show you how I can use an external mask in the sharpening step. So this is what the tool looks like. Uh, on the left is it's set up for how I'm going to use it for noise reduction. And you can see uh, there's settings for each layer, one through five. R is the residual, so everything bigger than five by five pixels. In, for each of these uh, wavelet layers, I have noise reduction settings, which vary from very strong for the, for the first wavelet layer. Remember I said the noise lives in the smallest layers. So it's set very strong in layers one and two and getting progressively uh, weaker and weaker in the larger wavelet layers. You also see I've got a linear mask. I'm gonna show you how that works. Shifting gears later on in the process, all we have to do is turn off noise reduction in all the layers and adjust the detail in some of the layers. And uh, in this case, we're just gonna apply that to the brightness component of a color image. So that's all I wanted to show you in terms of the slide presentation. And now let's move into PixInsight. And I'm just gonna stop for a sec and make sure that everybody can see my screen. Uh, yeah, Ron, um, it looks good. And everything's running fine. Here you're fine. And remember, when you when you stop like that, we naturally mute our mics so that we aren't disturbing you or anything else like that. So whenever you ask us a question, it takes us a second or three to reach up, click ourselves back on, and talk to you. So I expect I expect okay. that. That's okay. fine. Okay. And I'm just going to have a sip of water. I'll be right with you. Okay. I'm finally settling. Oh yeah, in. that was good. All this starting up time routine going so okay this is an image of the leo trio it's a linear master luminance uh, made of a bunch of uh i think it's like 30 10 minute subs and uh i'm just going to auto stretch it and zoom right in on it and now i'm going to go to 200 percent 
Can you see all the fine noise in there? Maybe I need to go a little finer. I'm sure you can see it, the salt and pepper noise. There's some darker pixels and some brighter pixels. And that's the first thing that I want to get rid of. So the only thing that's been done to this master is I cropped away the bad edges and I applied dynamic background extraction to get a nice smooth image. While we're working on this, I'm gonna take a preview so that we just work on a preview. Okay. And I'm gonna zoom in so you can really see this. Now here's multi-scale linear transform and it's set up to do noise reduction. So again, as I step through these layers, you can watch these numbers change. And you can set these various sliders. Basically the threshold is uh, how aggressive should the noise reduction be all overall. And the amount is how much to apply. Think of it as a coarse slider and a fine slider. And then number of iterations. I've never really felt the need to use more than one iteration. Before we can use this tool, we need to set up the linear mask. And the best way to do that is with a real-time preview. So if you've used Photoshop, you know that as you're changing settings, you see things updating in real time. That doesn't happen with a regular viewing PixInsight, but you can create a real-time preview that shows in real time what's going on. And in this case, I want to preview the mask. Now, this is a linear file. It hasn't been stretched. I have a, an automatic screen stretch applied, and therefore it's distorting what this mask should look like. I need to turn that off to see what the mask is gonna do. When you're using a mask, white selects and black protects. So in other words, wherever this mask is white is gonna receive noise reduction. Wherever the mask is black is gonna receive protection from the noise reduction. Now, I think this mask could be a little more aggressive, so I'm just gonna lower this amplification slider a little bit, and I'm gonna sharpen up the stars to give them more protection by reducing the smoothness a little bit. That's a very nice internal mask. So now that I have the mask set the way I want it, I can turn off that preview of the mask and reapply my auto stretch. Now, I can see the before and after just by clicking here. Right now you're looking at the after, so noise reduction applied. And there's what we started with. That's before and after. What I'd like you to notice is that we haven't lost any of the stars, nor have we compromised any of this lovely detail in the galaxy. Okay, I'm gonna just pause here and ask if there's any questions. Uh, Ron, Terry here, I have a question. Uh, what's the difference between starlet transform and multi-scale linear transform in the drop-down box? Right. <laughs> Excuse me. First of all, for all of these things, you can open a tooltip. Starlet uh, is, a, is an efficient, uh, very efficient tool. They basically say uh, that it's usually the best tool. The multi-scale linear transform tool is an older tool. It has a couple of disadvantages that are listed here. I'm not really familiar with them. For most images, and I've tried to compare them, I didn't see a difference to my eye. And so I stick with the uh, Starlet Transform, which is the default. 
Thank you, Ron. Uh, Eric, uh, are you getting any questions over in um, on the YouTube chat? Remember, members out there, you can enter your uh, comments and uh, ask any questions directly into the YouTube chat or into the Rumble Talk chat, depending on where you are and what you what you're been doing. So, Eric, do we have anything over there in um, in um, no, not yet. I'm watching. Actually, I'm chatting on a couple okay. other things, but uh, no, no questions right now. Okay, and we, um, we, uh, okay. Okay, then I'll just okay, continue. Eric, wait, no, no, Ron, we do have some questions. We've got, oh, like sure. I said, one too many um, chat systems going on here. We're gonna. That's why we have to figure this out someday and straighten it up. Okay. Um, Linda has asked. You said at one point that that there's a five by five uh pixels represented and she was wondering if that should be 32 by 32 uh, although at different levels it's different sizes maybe that was it correct so layer one is one by one two by two is four four by four is 16 eight by eight 64 and so on okay um, and Linda, if you have a follow-up question, be sure to type it in. Almiko wants to know, um, should you be using um, RGB or luminance in the target box? Uh, it depends. Well, so on a luminance image, it doesn't matter. Okay. On a, on a chrominance image, so an RGB image, mm -hmm. at the linear stage, if you're going to be adding luminance later, I would do the RGB like this. It'll do each component separately. Okay. Um, Steve D wants to know what the toolbar is at the left edge of the window. Um, uh, is he referring to the one, the left edge of the image window? Uh, yeah. Let's go over there, and if that, um, if that de doesn't answer the question, uh, he can ask again. Okay. So this is called the view identifier tab. The dark one is the one that's active. The view identifier tab, in addition to the name, gives a wealth of information. So just hovering over it brings up a thumbnail that tells you the path to the file, the, the dimensions of the image, whether it's grayscale or color, uh, how many bits it is, uh, and what's, you know whether it's been changed or not since it was saved. Okay. Ron, uh, this yeah. is there. there was a question that came up, and I actually had the same question. Uh, how would this compare to uh, MMT? And that was a question posted here. Or TGV denoise? Okay, so let's let's do TGV denoise first. TGV denoise is the method of choice for removing residual noise after stretching. However. I want to remove most of the noise before stretching. So I use a uh, multi-scale linear transform, or you could multi use multi-scale median transform for noise reduction. OK, so then the question is, why MLT versus MMT? I've tried them both, and I find it easier to get a good result with MLT. MMT also works well. I just find it harder to dial in the settings for no additional benefit that I see in my images. Uh, okay. And I think we're okay on Rumble Talk. How are you doing over on um, YouTube, Eric? We're all caught up. Thanks. Okay. Ron, it's back to you. Okay. Is my screen still being shared? Yeah, Ron, would you um, would you poke your uh, – you're, you're on um, – you're in the room. Would you poke your cursor up into the upper left-hand corner of your main screen and show them the um, um, the monitor? No, you don't have that. Never mind. I, I think I know what the answer is to uh, the question about what Steve wanted to know was the special uh, menu that was showing. Okay. I don't Here? think that's it. That one? Okay, yeah, tell us what that one is, just in case. This is the process console. It's kind of like your favorites menu, if you like. Um, and some people have it open. Some people don't. You can, uh, 
you can open or close those, uh, they're called explorer windows. You can open or close them from here. The process console, you don't have a choice. It's always open. But anything else, you can close and make it disappear. You can add it back in as a, uh, as a, uh, an explorer window here. So I just added that back in. One useful one is the History Explorer. I already have mine loaded, it's down here at the bottom. Okay, I think that does it for now. And if it doesn't, Steve can get back to us. Okay, so we're done. You've seen, you've seen multi-scale linear transform in this configuration. Now I'm gonna take you much further along in the workflow. And this is now a color image. And I don't know how good it looks on your screen, but on my screen, it looks pretty darn good. Yeah. Good. Not bad at all. The background is nice and smooth because we used MLT early on in the process. And then I've already used TGVD noise to clean up the background. Um, but now we've got these lovely galaxies that could show more detail. So there's one, there's another, and another. And I'd like to see if I can enhance the arms a little bit here. But the first thing I need to do is apply a mask. And this is the mask I'm going to use. Uh, this isn't really a mask making, um, demonstration, but the way I made the mask, I'll just show you very quickly is with the range selection tool. Here's a preview of my mask. So I'm just going to select the bright areas and then I'm going to blur the heck out of it. Maybe get rid of the stars. Something like that. So that's a quick and dirty way to make a mask. This mask, I cleaned it up a little more. I used clone stamp to get rid of some of the stars that were left over. And if I drag it over to the sidebar, I apply the mask to the image and you'll see um, it turns red. Uh, red is the protected areas, and you can see the galaxies showing through the mask. So those are the areas that are going to receive some sharpening. Now, knowing the mask is in place, and we can see that by the brown bar. See how the view identifiers turn brown? We can turn the, the mask visibility off. It's still in place but uh, we're just not seeing it. Okay, so now I'm gonna, I'm gonna double click on this icon here and it's gonna replace these settings with my sharpening settings. So remember, I'm far along in the workflow. This is a nonlinear image. In other words, it's been stretched and extensively processed. It's almost done. And now, I no longer need the linear mask because I'm using my external mask. However, I do need some de-ringing. So anytime you do sharpening, you can get this effect that looks like raccoon eyes around bright stars. It's called the Gibbs effect. And de-ringing is the tool for eliminating that. And we just want to use the lowest possible setting that gets rid of the raccoon eyes. And uh, 0 0.02 just about does it. I experimented before. If we use higher than necessary values, we won't get enough sharpening. If we use lower than necessary values, we're going to get raccoon eyes. So you just have to experiment a little bit. And to the question that came up before, what should I apply this to? This is now an LRGB image. So I applied luminance to a color image. In this case, 
the IC's detail in the luminance, in the bright, I shouldn't call it luminance actually, it's been stretched, it's called lightness. The eye sees the detail in the lightness channel. And so that's what I want to sharpen. Rather than sharpening the chrominance, I'm going to just sharpen the lightness. And let's have a look. This is just a preview. Let's have a look. There we go. So we got some very nice enhancement of detail in the core of the galaxy. But notice that the stars haven't changed. The dim parts of the galaxy haven't changed. And the background is protected. So let's now try it on another galaxy. We have to make sure we like it everywhere. That's quite a nice effect. Let me zoom in for you. Before, after. I think the de-ringing is a little bit too high and that's why those stars are getting a little bit bigger. And so I might lower this a little. Try again. That's better. Go back and check this one. So it's always iterative. You want to kind of sneak up on the best result. And notice all we're doing here is we're applying a little bit of sharpening in layer two and three, we're not sharpening the smallest layer where the noise lives. And we're using a mask to be very selective about where we, where we provide any sharpening. And let's do the same thing here. Let me make this bigger for you. Let's do the same thing here. And when we have settled in on settings that we think we like, we can just verify our mask is in place and now we can apply this to the whole image. And that's done. Okay, so that's the demonstration. I'm gonna leave my screen sharing up in case there's questions. Okay, let's start with Eric. Uh, you got anything over in uh, YouTube? Uh, no, but I do have a question. I noticed that the stars within the galaxy seem to get a little brighter no matter which setting you actually chose. Is there a way around that, or is it just too difficult to mask those stars? Oh, no. It's it's very possible to mask those stars. So uh, I'm, I'm going to leave the mask in place but just disable it, and I'm just going to open up the star mask process and... With default settings, I'm not going to mess around here. I'm just going to generate a star mask quickly. There we go. And let me get my sharpen mask and uh, do some pixel math. So last time I was on this channel, I did some pixel math and I demonstrated how you could uh, subtract one mask from another. So I'm going to go sharpen mask minus star mask and I'm going to create a new image which we'll call um, star free sharpen mask you can call it anything and i'm just going to hit go and there we go so now if i just get this out of the way i'm going to undo my sharpening and let's apply this mask instead 
now those stars should receive some protection. Now we've got some ringing. I don't know if you see that. Oh, sorry, I didn't activate the mask. Now it's active. Do you see the dark ring around the bright star, though? That's the ringing I was talking about. All right, here we go. That's done a good job protecting the stars, right? Ron, are you talking? Yes, sir. I was talking. Yeah, we can hear you, Ron. Okay, good. So uh, the answer is yes, I could have spent more time making my mask. So you see how I used pixel math to remove the stars from this mask. So if I show you what that mask looks like in place, the stars are now protected, including this star that was getting affected and this one up here that was getting affected before. Uh, let's also look in the hamburger galaxy. Yeah, this star that was getting affected before, it's now going to be protected. There you go. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes, that's very nice. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Also, it should do a nice job on this. And this, let's have a look. Oh, yeah. So that's just spending a little bit more time making the right mask. And when we're happy, we apply it to the whole image. Boom. Look at the detail. That's crazy. There we are. Other questions? No, oh, I'm all set over here on YouTube, uh, Alex. Is Alex there? Hmm. He's here, but uh, we're not hearing him right now, and I guess there are no more questions in Rumble Talk. Should I stop sharing my screen now? Uh, are you done? I am. Yes, but we need to, need to get Alex back because he's the moderator. Alex, can you hear me? Well, we seem to have lost Alex, but uh, that was an excellent presentation. Um, I wasn't aware that MMT was really for the for the non for the linear images versus nonlinear, and that TGB denoise was for the nonlinear. I guess I've used MMT for nonlinear images as well. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Um, I I think TGB is a better tool for nonlinear images. I, I've tried them both. I, I don't get nearly as good results with uh, MLT, MMT. I've also tried ACDNR. And uh, by far, the best tool for a nonlinear image is TGB denoise, in my experience. We still seem to have lost Alex. Uh, Ron, do you have any strategies for coming up with reasonable values for the the bias levels and the threshold amounts? I start at about 0.1 and increase or decrease from there. And uh, I use Warren Keller's rule of kind of halvesies and twosies. So I start at 0.1. If that's not enough, I'll go up to 0.2. If it's too much, I'll go down to 0.05. And then I keep splitting the difference or doubling. Sorry about my dog, guys. 
Yeah, so I, I keep splitting the difference or doubling until I home in on the right uh, setting. Ron, is there any way to mask the noise of the dog barking? <laughs> I don't have a dog mask. But I no longer need to uh, to share my screen, I don't think. I don't think you're sharing your screen now. Oh, right now all I'm seeing is big me. Oh, because yeah. I'm presenting, I guess. Uh, Terry, do you have any more questions? I don't know what happened to Alex. I'll send him a note. There's stuff in the chat. Um, no, no, no questions. Sorry. Oh, I just had uh, some at the door. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, it looks like Alex has lost his audio. It says in the group chat. We have some nice compliments uh, over on the chat. Would you like me to read those? Also, or can you see those yourself, Ron? Uh, I don't see them. I, I have used the um, multi-scale linear transform with better results than the starlet transform. I find the starlet transform very aggressive. Or is that just is that just me? Uh, your mileage may vary. There's many ways to skin a cat. Of course. I find that if you do a really good job dialing in the linear mask, MLT with the uh, Starlet Transform does a great job. But dialing in that linear mask is really important. And the big mistake uh, that I made, and I'm sure most people do because I, 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 I don't know where it was documented. I found it by accident is when you're adjusting the mask using your real-time preview, you have to turn the stretch off. Otherwise, you don't see the linear mask. You see a stretched version of the mask. And it's very garish. It's all black and white. Whereas the mask should be black and white and shades of gray. Okay. So that's while you're adjusting, when you're previewing the mask, and maybe I'm going to share my screen again for a second, if that's okay. Give me a minute. All right. So that was the other demo. So this was for noise reduction. I've I've got a, a preview selected, so we're not looking at the whole thing. And I want to preview my mask. Notice everything gets grayed out. This is now going to allow me to adjust these two settings, amplification and smoothness of the mask. If I open a real-time preview here, that's not the right appearance of the mask. You have to turn off the auto stretch. And here's the button for doing that. That is what the mask really looks like. That's a pretty good setting for the mask. I might lower this to 80 a little bit. 60, 70. Maybe lower the smoothness a little to, sh to protect the small stars. That's good. Now I can close this, turn my screen stretch back on, and apply this to the preview to see if I like the, oops, sorry, got to turn off preview mask. Apply it to the preview to see if I like the result. That's after, before. So here we're just trying to take out all that salt and pepper noise. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Ron, we're back. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what's happened to Alex, but I assume eventually he's going to work his way back in. Eric, Alex, are you there? Oh, I hear him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what happened to Alex either. Um, it happens sometimes with Alex. I'm sorry. It just it's like that. <laughs> um, okay. 
Uh, did you manage to get into some questions that were over from Rumble Talk? I don't know. I was only gone for about three minutes, but uh, Linda asked what the difference between luminance and lightness in your target drop down menu. Did you get that answered? No, I, I, th that question wasn't asked yet. Okay. So uh, luminance really is the signal that comes through a clear filter, a luminance filter. And so it's the unstretched uh, master that comes through your clear filter. Lightness is the lightness channel of an image. And generally that would be a stretched image because you don't add lightness to chrominance until after both of them have been stretched. So that would be done using LRGB combination. If I can just stretch, uh, sorry, if I can share my screen again for a moment, let me do this and do that. I'm gonna open a different project. I'm gonna go ahead and open my uh, project on this folder so you can see where it's so that you can see where the lightness got added to the RGB. So there is a process called LRGB combine. And basically I process my chrominance or my RGB data independently from my lightness data that came through the luminance filter. And when they're both pretty well done, then I replace the lightness of the chrominance image with the real high quality lightness that I got with the luminance filter. I know that's kind of jargony, but hopefully that will explain. Um, so this is my finished project for this file. And I can go into the history of this image. and go right back to where they were combined. So I'm gonna go back to the step before. And I can close that now. So what you're looking at now, it contains just the RGB image. And over here is my lightness channel and you'll see it's called Synthal because I synthesized it from the luminance, the red, the green, and the blue. I often do that. So this is the lightness channel. And it's been processed. You can see it has a, a full history. So I cleaned up the background. I applied deconvolution. I applied noise reduction the way we just talked about, and then I stretched it. And I'm just gonna shrink that back down neatly out of the way. The RGB, if we look at its history, I, uh, I did the background correction, combined the channels, balanced the color, did the noise reduction, and did the initial stretch. That's what we're looking at right now. And now we're ready to add the lightness into the, RGB, and we'll do that with, sorry, I'm just getting to a good place here where you can see it. I'm just going to step forward so you can see the effect of adding the high quality lightness, which was made from a blend of the luminance, red, green, and blue filter data. Oh, let's, there we go. Before, after, before, after. So you can see what the lightness added. And now the image isn't done at this stage. So I'm just gonna step through the various steps. I'm still stepping through, still stepping through. I'm doing about one step every two or three seconds. It's almost done now. Now it's done. Okay. 
Linda, if you have a follow-up, ask it, and I know we've got some others. Now, Mako wants to know, how is what you've shown us tonight, now is this different from using an unsharp mask? Uh, unsharp mask has less control, and what I would say is try it both ways. See what you prefer. So I occasionally use unsharp mask uh, after I've used MLT for sharpening. But again, I find MLT to give me much finer control because I can sharpen just specific layers. Unsharp mask is not a wavelet-based tool. Okay. Um, Linda, again, what does the linear and multi-scale linear transfer refer to? Is it linear data or something linear in the method of processing or it's something linear in the method of processing. Okay. It's linear transformation of the data for either sharpening or for noise reduction. Uh, I don't know exactly what the mathematics are, but that's what it refers to. The alternative method that's in the same menu with PixInsight, uh, I'll show you where it is. It's over here in the multi-scale menu. The alternative is multi-scale median transform. Uh, I won't go through it, but it looks very similar. Uh, it also has a built-in linear mass that you can use. You can have pretty much the same noise reduction settings, except that it has this adaptive setting. And if you find you get little dark blotches in your image, increase the adaptive setting until those disappear. Otherwise, it operates very similar to uh, MLT. I've tried them both, and I, I think I said before, I just find it easier to dial in nice settings with multi-scale linear transform than I do with multi-scale median transform. As with so many things in Pix Insight, there's lots of different ways to get to the same place. Exactly. Yeah. And many of them are really related. They're, they're, they're just different ways of presenting the math algorithms exactly a um, couple of compliments about um, how you've added a few uh, tools to the toolbox and things like that um, and how other people have also done it so that's good um, Ron in MLT there is a target drop down choices between CIEL and CIEY yeah. What's the so, distinction between those two? Yeah. That's here. Can you see my screen still? Uh, I, yeah. I have a difficult time. I've got four different versions of the screen going on. Let me see. Yes. Okay. Lightness. C I E. -L. Yeah. So the lightness is after stretching, basically, and the luminance is what came through the luminance filter. Okay. You can see. Uh, with the tooltip, lightness applies the transform to the lightness component of a nonlinear color target image. Okay. Luminance applies the transform to the brightness component of a linear color target image. Generally, you won't use luminance here. You'll use lightness if you're working on the lightness channel, and you'll use RGBK. Actually, you can use RGBK for the uh, lightness channel too. But when you're working on an image where you've added luminance or sorry lightness into the chrominance, like we did here, then we want to apply the sharpening only to the lightness. Noise reduction, we would apply to RGBK because on the lightness, it'll just go to the the K, right? Black and white. Okay. When you're working with one shot color, is it best to use the luminance or the RGB to do this kind of work? RGB. Okay. Uh, we are, I believe, through the questions. Um, how about you over there, Eric, on YouTube? Uh, nothing new. So some nice comments earlier, uh, okay. but no new questions. 
Um, I'd like to ask a question for Ron. Uh, how did last week go up in Canada someplace? Were you guys oh, going to show? Warren and I taught Pix Insight uh, for three days in Kitchener, Ontario. We had a, a great group. I mean, we, we just loved doing it. It was a, an awesome group. One person won a QHY camera. Uh, everybody had a good time. The evaluations were good. So every time we teach this, I have people fill out an evaluation form at the end of the course. And uh, I compile that, Warren, and I use it to figure out what's what and how to make things better. Um, we're thinking the the next course, we're going to do a two-day format. We think that's going to help reduce the cost for people, uh, particularly in terms of taking time off work. Uh, so if we just do Saturday, Sunday, people still have to travel on Friday. So uh, we figure we can do it in two days and still do a good job. We've kind of learned what's really essential to cover and what we can cover privately with people in the process, your own data sessions. So it looks like you and Ron, are, or you and um, what's his name? Um, Warren. Warren are gonna be doing this again sometimes. Yeah, we're exploring a couple of places. Chicago is one. And we're looking at uh, somewhere in Ohio. Uh, we need to find a host first. So if anybody's got ideas for a host in either of those locales, let me know. What's it take to be a host? Just somebody that happens to have a business that might have a conference room? or Yeah, we need a facility with a couple of big screens, room for people to set up their laptops, uh, coffee, refreshments, chairs, tables, lots of power. Holds about and, 25 uh, people or so? Well... We kind of max out around 25 or so because we like to give people a lot of individual attention. Uh, we can do as little as 17 to 20. Uh, 20 to 25, I would say, is ideal. While we got you, could you also tell us a little bit about uh, if I just wanted to come to Dr. Ron and say, hey, help me out here with this. Could you just like tutor me? Oh, yeah, I, I do tutoring online. I charge 60 US an hour and uh, get paid by PayPal. And uh, I'm not very good at keeping time. <laughs> so uh, it's a good hour. And uh, basically, I remote into your computer or you can remote into mine and we work with your data or work with mine, get you where you, where you wanna be with Pix Insight. Um, one other thing that I wanted to ask you while I had you, is uh, what, are you, what are you talking about at AIC? Tell these folks about AIC, what's happening there? So AIC is going to be November to uh, November 15th to 17th in San Jose, California. Uh, I'm one of the speakers there. There's a, quite an incredible lineup of speakers. They call it the, the best gathering of astrophotographers under one roof. And uh, I hope I get to go to some of those talks. But what I'm talking about is I'm doing introduction to astrophotography for beginners so basic hardware software setting up your equipment very basic things to think about so it'll be a two-hour workshop delivered twice cool I'm, yeah. I'm also presenting up there i don't know if you know that um but i'm also presenting about the sequence generator pro up there oh excellent ron what do you what kind of locations do you normally use i mean local colleges businesses college is fine but typically we've done it in a local business uh you know some kind of a large meeting room where there's enough room for people at least one very large screen or two large screens uh so the people at the back can see well as well now there isn't a huge number of astrophotographers in the chicago area uh, so if you set up a conference, do you pull people in from, you know, surrounding areas? Yeah, we do. We've had people come as far from as far away as New Zealand just to take our course. Uh, that was our course in L.A. And we had a woman come all the way from Norway just to take our course in Mesa, Arizona. I, you know, I think you have my email. Why don't you send me a note? Because there are a couple of places. Uh, I live just west of Chicago. Uh, which we might be able to arrange. Would you mind sending me your email? Because I don't know who I'm talking to. Oh, uh, this I is our see... goal. We've 
we've corresponded before. But Sorry, what's actually, actually, guys, Eric, um, on the invitation to the room tonight, uh, Ron's name's on there, so you can just use that. Yeah, okay. just fire me an email, Eric. Okay. By the way, what is, uh, I don't know if you give it out here, or do you have a website that people, if they want to do this, um, um, if they want to do this tutoring thing, how do they get a hold of you? I think that was uh, Mary, in your you first can, slide that went by real quick. Well, you can find me here. You sharing? Astrodoc.ca. Astro Are you sharing your screen? Oh, right. sorry. I'm not sharing my screen. Let me do that. Uh, so While you're doing that, uh, uh, Chris Pagan says, hey, what about Florida? And Tom C says, yeah, Orlando would be great. Guys, let me tell you what, what I think I heard Ron say was what you need to do is find some business in the area or club or church group or somebody that's got a hall big enough to hold 20 some people with a screen and um, maybe a local camera store sponsor or uh, whatever. Exactly. That that kind of thing. You got exactly. to help arrange that because that's that's the key to arranging all this is to find a place for it. That's the hard part. And you got to find ten or twelve people who want to come. You yeah, know, you, can, you know, particularly if you're part of an astronomy class or astronomy club or something like that, you might have a few there, but. Um, this is a big operation and it takes a lot of planning up from what I understand. So, yeah, it does. I mean, it's a, it's an intense, but really good course. So here's my email address. And I'm just going to leave that slide up for a second. So it's R B R E C H E R at rogers.com. So you can find that on the video. You can also go to my website, which is, astrodoc.ca and if you click on any of these thumbnails and then click on the image it'll take you to its page you can sign up to get onto my mailing list if you want to um, you can even see what the weather's like at my observatory tonight which is crap here we oh, are. yeah, you're special. Like everybody else has good weather right now. Oh, that's terrible. Bummed. Terrible. Amico wants you to come back to Mesa, Arizona. <laughs> we had fun there. That was that was great yeah. fun. Any um any more questions over there on the other side, Eric? Uh no, I think everyone is quieted down. And I think we got everybody on Rumble Talk, so now it's time to say goodbye, everybody. Okay, thanks, you guys. Thanks so much for stepping in real quick, Ron. No problem. I hope it wasn't too short, but I just figured pick uh, pick a couple of topics and cover them. And uh, that's that's what we asked of you, and you did a great job as usual. Thank Good you night, very everybody. much. Everybody, we'll see you next week. And next week, um, we're gonna hear what are we gonna hear about uh, Sydney, right? From um, Sydney, you're here, right? You want to come in and uh, say something about what you're gonna talk about? Oh, I guess you're not here. Now you're coming back here. He might not. He didn't even hear that. Good night, everybody. Okay. Good night, everybody. Stop the broadcast, Alex. Stop.